many of the core technologies, vendors, and companies that you probably work with already in your data centers and inside of your organizations. What is Hadoop's place within that? And then how do all these other companies work closely with it to integrate it in to their reference architecture as they go to market? So you'll hear from a number of partners, EMC, SAP, and HP as they talk through that. And then we'll end today with David Epstein. Um, this will be an interesting one. David will be a fun conversation. And what he's going to go through is we all talk about big data and what that means. David's view is really you can get all this data, but it's how do you find that small difference, that small window that you can go exploit and take advantage of. And think of that in things like sports and other analogies, Moneyball, et cetera, where it's how do you leverage data to take advantage of it? What can you do when you can find that small insight through data discovery of broad sets of data? And he'll put a fun spin on it in terms of how they think of it and applying it to different industries. So otherwise, same today with the community showcase, what's happening out there, Cafe Hadoop. How many here got to stop at Cafe Hadoop yesterday? Okay, pretty good group. I think you get to see some of the tech titans in terms of what they're doing, get to hear how they're thinking of Hadoop, and you get hands-on and get to go play with it while you're sitting with them and sit with the experts. So same thing, wireless, nothing's changed from yesterday, so hopefully everybody has this from yesterday. So I want to get to the party. Party will be fun tonight. So for all of you here, San Pedro Square, if I could emphasize one thing, you have to bring your badge, otherwise we'll have all of San Jose right, hanging out there with us in San Pedro Square. But bring your badge, you get to walk around different bands, different places to eat. It's a lot of fun. And I know last year, a lot of people had a lot of fun with it because it's a free form environment, good way to interact with all of your peers at the conference, have some good food, some good fun, and listen to some great music, okay? So with that, what I'd like to do is get this started today and bring up our first speaker. First speaker is CJ Desai, President of Emerging Technologies from EMC. And what he's going to talk about is as our, you know, as a partner, welcome CJ. Glad First, to be I'll here. I'll hand this to you. Thank you. We've had a partner. Down goes the flag, and number one is away. Bump into the saddle, and off he goes. A very nice start indeed. Here's McGinnis. Wow, well, what a championship he's having. John McGinnis is absolutely flying. McGinnis has broken the lap record. McGinnis is a, a real nexus. I've just I've almost lost the word. He's your winner, John McGinnis. So John McGinnis, uh, the gentleman who was shown, um, he has won 21 Isle of Man TT competitions. And till yesterday, this is one of the most dangerous, if not the most dangerous, race courses out there. And just this morning, he won the 22nd one. So at EMC, we decided that, hey, let's find out, is it the man, the machine, or the combination of two, why on one of the most dangerous race courses, this individual has won so many races. Just to give you an idea of how dangerous this race course is, over its history of this race, there have been 240 deaths. So they are constantly working on improving the safety and making sure that they give proper guidance to people who want to race here. So again, EMC kicked off a project. We put sensors on the men and the machine itself. We did a simulation in Spain, and then we launched it off to the data science community to figure out what was the reason, why does he win so many times, 21 till yesterday, 22 as of this morning, and the results were really, really interesting. And then in the fall, we are going to actually, for the race, we are going to have John wear sensors as well as his machine, the bike, and see what happens in the actual race. So when we did simulation, we announced a competition. It was very well received. And now in the fall, EMC is going to be sponsoring the actual race and figuring out what's the reason behind him winning so many competition on this most dangerous race course. So with that, EMC's Emerging Technologies Division is focused on solving the infrastructure challenges 
for these new workloads like Hadoop. So if I have to simplify, the team at EMC is working on figuring out how best we can help so that the adoption of Hadoop is easier for the enterprises. So some of the design principles behind our infrastructure products or storage products, I would say, is one, scale out architecture. And the reason scale out is you should be able to start small and grow as much as you would like. So you don't have to start really big. You don't know how much capacity you are going to use and what's the data growth rate. Second is built-in analytics, and this is key because EMC is a leader and innovator in storage. We want to make sure that while we are holding the data, you should be able to run analytics workload on top of it. Third is software-defined storage. So EMC has recently, over the past few years, moved more towards the software direction, whether it's scale-out blocks, scale-out files, scale-out object, we want to make sure that the value is in the software, and similar to Hadoop, you can run this on commodity hardware. I would say the open source and taking inspiration from this community right here, just last month we announced that our storage automation as well as provisioning software, we open sourced it, made it available for the first time on GitHub on Friday, and you will see from EMC more and more products will be open source, again, similar principle as Hadoop, in trying to leverage community's expertise to make our products better. And the last point on next generation flash, this one is important because as the analytics workload move from batch to real time, how can we harness the power of flash so that you can run workloads at a much faster rate when you want real time data? So all of you know this really well. It was, I think, 2004 when um, the original white paper on MapReduce was published. Then the team at Yahoo took it. And what a phenomenal evolution over the last 10 years or so. I mean, I saw the attendance numbers here, 4,000 badges, 300 more to come. Uh, definitely huge growth rate in this community right here. And the evolution over figuring out how to for a variety of use cases, as you saw yesterday, but our focus and EMC's focus is usually enterprise, enterprise infrastructure. And what we see is for enterprises that are trying to adopt Hadoop, how can we make it simpler for you? The challenges you have in enterprise infrastructure where you have data silos, you have a variety of tools, you have existing investment in the infrastructure, you have to work with sourcing, lines of business asking you different things. So how can we enable so that it makes it easier for you to deploy Hadoop? Now, when we look at the ecosystem that has evolved and multiple Hadoop distributions, whether you know Hortonworks, Cloudera, and others, or Pivotal, which is part of EMC family, you know, pretty good about open source strategy on the distributions and then the tools that are on top of it. And we want to make sure, again, that we provide infrastructure as this community contributes to the evolution of this great technology platform. We want to make sure that we make it easier for you while you face the challenges with the typical enterprise IT infrastructure and silos. So from our standpoint, because EMC is an infrastructure provider or the storage provider, you know, what are some of the challenges for mass market adoption of Hadoop? So first is, once you want to make Hadoop as a truly enterprise class platform, you need enterprise grade reliability. Simple things like making sure it's highly available. You can have backup, replication, security, your compliance requirement, whether you are a pharmaceutical or financial services organization, you have to make sure that this platform can support just the basics of what enterprises typically look for. The second is process the data in place. So if you look at the 90s evolution on data warehouses and others and you know variety of databases, the data actually moved to the tools. Data moved to the tools and then people figured out, hey, how can I run 
uh, reports and you know have my data warehouse that can scale to whatever the terabytes or petabytes of data back then. What we are trying to also make sure is that data is in place and rather than data moving to the tools, tools should move to the data. Second is, you know, when I look at RDBMS evolution, and yes, you know, there are questions about, hey, where are we on the maturity curve on Hadoop platform side? The multiple distribution and tool set is just gonna be a reality, right? There will be multiple distributions, there will be certain tool sets, and as the industry evolves, we are going to see that a few, um, few of these tool sets become very prevalent, both from a market share and adoption standpoint. So when I look at multiple distribution is going to be a reality, then how can we ensure that at least the data set on which these distributions and tool sets sit on top of is one as much as possible? I mean, that would be ideal because you can run multiple distributions on a single data set. That's where we would like to go. But right now it is still happening where you are creating multiple siloed infrastructure. Diversity of storage, similar to distributions and use cases, our goal is also from an adoption of Hadoop standpoint, give you the flexibility on the storage, right? So if, store, if you require file access or whether you have billions of files and you want object as the underlying infrastructure or whether you want a specific for real-time analytics, very, very fast underlying infrastructure, diversity of storage is key here. Uh, based on the use case you're going after. And then the last point is around multi-tenancy. So as from an enterprise standpoint, when I go and speak to customers, they feel comfortable. Hey, they've gone with a particular distribution. They are using a few tool sets on top of it. But multi-tenancy for lower end of the enterprise where you can run Hadoop as a service is a key feature that will enable the mass market adoption of Hadoop. Now, this is one thing that we are very focused on at EMC is what we'll call multi-protocol data lake for analytics. So one is to enable this adoption, we want to process the data that's in place. We want to support multiple protocol when you are writing specifically to your data, as in to your uh, infrastructure, when you want to modify or when you want to read from that specific infrastructure, you should be able to do that. And we want to provide as many protocol support as possible so you are not creating siloed infrastructure. So again, polyglot storage is key here that you have a single common data set and you can use various languages <clears throat> to either read from it or modify it. We also want to make sure that if you have a single data set, then you can be uh, secure, and all the policies around data management, uh, audits, and others for your regulatory compliance is still there. And then from reliability standpoint, we have to make sure that this data is available in a 24-7 type of format. There is no downtime as you add more data, ingest more data. I could easily see you use Splunk for ingesting data and then use Hadoop for further analysis. So one of the goal is multi-protocol data Lake will enable, rather than having multiple silos, you can just use one data lake, use multiple protocols to access data, and because the underlying data is still integral in the data lake, you can use multiple distributions on top of it. So right model for right use case, of course, we know the history of Hadoop and DAS was the primary uh, mechanism, we understand it, we completely endorse it, that when you want to use multiple distributions, you take data out of whichever the source it is and ingest and have uh, models running, whether it's you know, your favorite distribution, whether it's Horton, Splunk, and so on. On the shared model, like I said, if you use the data lake as a foundation, you have a single copy, then it allows you to use multiple distributions on top. So depending on your use case, it really varies whether you want to just go with DAS and start small or whether you want to use shared storage, okay? So from our standpoint, the way I look at it is if you want to have multiple distribution, don't know your two to three-year strategy on where you are going with your Hadoop 
uh, distribution and analytics tool set, maybe the one on left is better. If you have at least a lot of data already in the shared storage and you want to have multiple protocols supported, then maybe the right side is better. And this is really, really important when you get budget approved for Hadoop and the infrastructure that is lying below it, that you can get a good TCO, all the enterprise class features, security that you expect, and most importantly, performance as well. The uh, second thing I would say is, from a real-time analytics standpoint, going from descriptive to predictive, or from batch, from batch to real-time, when I look at, say, in financial services, uh, you want to run Monte Carlo types of simulation, your fraud detection algorithms, your security analytics types of application, where the time is of essence, the latency required is in microseconds, you're not talking milliseconds, and the performance required from the infrastructure should keep up. If my credit card is compromised, I don't want my credit card company to tell me after 12 to 24 hours. I would like to know that information within minutes that protects me as a consumer and also protects the enterprise as in the financial services organization from writing off a huge loss. So we are doing a lot of innovation in Flash to ensure that as we move from batch to real time, we provide you the technology so you can basically run analytics really fast. So EMC has three analytics storage platforms. We are a big believer in having rather some overlap than creating a gap for you. We want to make sure that if you already have a lot of data in our Isilon uh, scale-out NAS clusters, then you can use Isilon and, like I said, with multi-protocol support, run analytics or multiple distributions on top of it. We also have a cloud-scale object technology called ECS, and what ECS allows you to do, geo-level replication. I'm sure some of you may say today, why would I do geo-replicate? Uh, I can, you know, I have a DAS environment, and I'll figure this out. But if you want geo-level replication, single global namespace, performance for billions of files, small or large, then object is the right technology, and we have a product for that. And last but not least is DSSD. This is an acquisition that we did about a year ago. It's based right here locally in the Bay Area. And this is a rack scale flash. And what this allows you to do is microseconds latency, real-time analytics. We are working with some of the ecosystem partners here today uh, to ensure that we support multiple distribution so you can run reports like that could take 12 to 24 hours to run on a DAS type of environment, could run in a few minutes. Some queries for which you sit very long time where the business unit is asking that, hey, give us the performance data for our sales, marketing, whatever the case might be. Our goal is to enable so that you can run these reports really, really fast. So I would say that on a shared storage, and the term is very specific here, on a shared storage, 800 of you today in a variety of environments are using Isilon for in-place analytics. ECS, which is the recently launched products, allows you to have cloud scale. And I will use one example, a financial services organization that had credit card transactions in mainframe. They were copying that over 16 different uh, data sets, try to run various processing on it. We, using our Isilon technology, were able to leverage the infrastructure of Isilon, put all the data out there. They decided whatever they want to do it from a processing standpoint. It went from 50 racks in the data center to only five racks. It also allowed them to use whatever tools they wanted, whether it's distribution or tools on top of it, uh, to leverage the particular platform, as in Hadoop platform here, and enabled security government where they have peace of mind because it's a financial services organization. So we are seeing examples where shared storage does make sense. And again, there is no right model shared versus DAS, but depending on the use case, you can do that. And in the closing comments, you can visit us at booth D3. We have a couple of sessions today in the afternoon, but just to reiterate the message uh, from this deck is at EMC, we are very committed to providing you the storage infrastructure 
whether you want to do batch or real-time analytics, and our teams are working really, really hard to make sure that you can easily deploy and have a high performance and reliability at enterprise class level for your Hadoop platform. Thank you very much for your time. Herb, back to yep. you. Thank you, CJ. So I appreciate, appreciate the conversation, everything we're doing together. Yeah. Right. I know working with the whole EMC Federation, everything yeah. as you mentioned on shared yeah. storage, all the work in the open data platform initiative, all the work with Pivotal, right, on Definitely. certifying what happens with Hawk right. and HDP. And the last and example we used was ODP based. Exactly. So, yes. Exactly. Right. Well, thank you. Thank appreciate you so much. Bye -bye. All right. So now I have the pleasure of introducing Scott Now. So. For some of you who may know this, I first had the opportunity to meet Scott. Scott was the president of Teradata Labs, you know, had been there for many years driving the direction of Teradata as an enterprise data warehouse and the architecture and how it fit in the enterprise. You know, Scott's chosen to continue on with his journey in the data architecture, you know, and now join Hortonworks as CTO and to work with Hadoop and to start to see where does Hadoop take its place as that next generation data architecture inside of the enterprise. Um, Scott joined recently, so this is I'd say the first time in a public stage and coming out and talking about the customer journey and how he sees to do playing in that customer journey and what it means. We'll also have Russell Fulsmith join from TrueCar who give his perspective on what they've done as they've built their architecture out on Hadoop. So with that, Scott, come on out. And welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Here you go. Thanks. Well, it's really great to be back here uh, on stage at Hadoop Summit uh, for my fourth time. And uh, it's amazing just to watch the transformation and what's happened in the whole industry and how all of these new technologies that we're delivering are starting to really yield that customer value, that, that customer benefit that we've been talking about for so long. So what I'm going to talk about this morning for the few minutes that we have together is a little bit about what's driving our strategy and why I think we're at the right place at the right time with the right tools. But I'm going to focus also on some of those benefits that have been yielded from, uh, from the Hadoop ecosystem and the Hadoop stack. So core to the strategy and why I think this is so transformative for the industry is we call open enterprise Hadoop. Open means that we can now tap into the innovations and the ideas uh, from around the world, from a limitless developer uh, base. And open also implies not only lots of new ideas, lots of new brain cells kind of trying to solve those new big data problems, but it's also that community of openness where there's some friendly competition and there's a drive to innovate and a drive to innovate faster. And that openness is one of the, the biggest transformative things uh, that I see in the Hadoop space. Enterprise means you got to collect all of that and turn it into something that is trusted. That is trusted, that can be used, that can be deployed, that can be redeployed, that can really yield value in an enterprise. And that's really the core of our strategy, right? To build the best, the most breakthrough analytics, right? And those analytics have to be innovative, they have to be new, they have to show us something that we didn't intuitively know. And that is happening today. But to be relevant, they also need to be trusted, right? Have to be able to believe it, have to be able to take action in your business based on the analytic because you trust it and you're trusting your business, you're trusting your customer relationships to those analytics. And so that depends on this enterprise uh, notion that I talked about that includes governance, security, and operations. All of those things are really important. So let's look at some of the transformational analytics that are happening in the industry today with some you know, real customers, right? So web trends, the challenges are not unique. Yesterday in the keynotes and in the breakout sessions, we all heard about the challenges that are out there. There's a lot of data, it's hard to consume. It can be expensive to consume. It can be complicated. It can be uh, hard to be agile in this space. And in, in this machine learning with Spark solution, what Web Trends was able to do is reduce cost for data storage, deploy in the cloud to, again, make deployment easier and more seamless, and to process a whole lot more stuff, 10 billion events a day, 20 milliseconds or so per event. So this is really good. And this is helping, obviously, to drive 
extreme business benefit for their company. We have a stream analytics uh, use case from uh, Symantec, who I think also is presenting here at the conference today. Again, the challenges, expensive, can't keep all of the data, right? Latency is a problem, and that's been solved. And they're now processing 105 million log events per minute. And, you know, the bad guys are out there trying to break into all of our systems. And so being able to be this agile uh, and respond with all of the data and all of the analytic power that that data provides is uh, extremely important. And processing time was reduced uh, to a time that's actually helpful for driving value uh, in the business. Bell helicopters, when we talk about sensor data and understanding what's happening in very expensive equipment and being able to proactively manage that equipment to reduce downtime, to provide a better customer experience, and to combine all of the data from different siloed parts of the business into one place where the data can be analyzed. And that data can turn into analytics. And those analytics can really provide proactive recommendations, a better customer experience, and better total cost. Okay, so, and finally, getting a 360 degree view of the customer. And this is one of the more common use cases here. Uh, we're referencing a very large retailer who uh, has used a combination of solutions, including traditional databases as well as a Hadoop stack, to really create that 360 degree view of a retail customer. And this is extremely important, right? As consumers, we're all becoming more and more demanding. We expect, if you looked at yesterday's keynote speech, we expect to be treated like royalty. And if we're not, the cost is extreme because we will go somewhere else. And so being able to create a 360 degree view of a retail customer in high definition and be correct is extremely important. And combining different silos of data, different kinds of data, being able to analyze that data, right? And in this use case, uh, our, our customer has saved millions of dollars in storage costs, streamlined their inventory, and as a side benefit, actually got increased revenue by being able to be better and, and more intelligent about pricing and actually drove the top line as well as the bottom line with these solutions. All of the solutions that reference in these customer examples were all done with earlier versions of Hortonworks Data Platform. Earlier this week, we announced Hortonworks Data Platform 2.3. Lots of information uh, in, in our booth on, on, the, uh, on the expo floor talking about the different features and functions. But let, let me just give you kind of a high-level view of the things that are in here that we think will continue to help accelerate adoption and value creation from the overall Hadoop stack. Broke it down into really three uh, easy categories. Make it easier for users to use this stuff. Make consumption easier, that's really good. Make it more secure and easy to govern and support it better. These are really, uh, truly the enterprise grade features that we've added into HDP where we combine the open, the innovation, all the new algorithms, all the new analytics, and put it through the, the enterprise grade test to make it easier to consume and more trusted. So in the user experience, there really are um, two kinds of users of the system, right? There's the, the operational aspect of a user of, uh, of HDP, and we've made it easier for operations, easier to set up and install, customizable dashboards for the operational staff so they can actually track cluster uh, health and cluster utilization over time, and much easier provisioning for, um, for more agile uh, analytic delivery and deployment. Again, uh, all centered around uh, Ambari and a graphical user interface that makes it easier for the operator. For developers, we've also created some, uh, some really important ease of use capabilities, including uh, visualization for, for SQL. Uh, again, making it easier to kind of interact and see what's going on. Improvements to uh, machine learning and Apache Spark on Yarn to make, uh, to make processing uh, easier to implement and a little bit more uh, efficient. <clears throat> and some uh, fault tolerance and some other enterprise uh, enhancements for streaming applications to make them more dependable. So the user experience, uh, a large amount of investment and, and a large piece of HDP 2.3. Security and governance, also very important as part of being trusted, 
uh, we've created a, a whole bunch of things that help the security administrator, including encryption of data at rest, which is obviously really important in today's world, security and privacy, and all of the data that we're collecting, being able to be confident that only those that have a need to access and a need to know uh, can have it, encryption of data at rest, as well as easier deployment of authorization uh, and uh, uh, security access and scalable metadata services to provide the ability to actually audit what's going on. Data governance, keeping track of what data you have, where it is, how it got there, really, really important. So we've created you know, three basic uh, concepts inside of here, transparent governance standards for, uh, for data governance and the data steward, data landscapes to make it easy to reproduce relevant data landscapes for additional applications and users, and again, enhancements to metadata services to really understand what's out there and what's in. The final piece of enterprise grade is really around support. Once these things are built and deployed, they've got to be supported to be trusted. They, they become dependent on by the business. So in addition to the, the, uh, the support, the traditional support, including uh, customer portal and knowledge base, on-demand training, and uh, and access to uh, support analysts, we've actually added Hortonworks Smart Sense to be a little bit more proactive in terms of the overall support uh, and the trusted nature of the cluster. And Smart Sense provides uh, dashboards and recommendations on how to improve the overall operations and management of your system. And there's an example of one of those dashboards here. Uh, and again, with, in here, there are a few proactive uh, recommendations that are actually on the screen. So we think that in addition to uh, continuing to invest in optimized case resolution and, and uh, providing that real-time support that, that you need, this proactive smart sense adds another facet to the supportability and truly to the enter enterprise-grade capabilities of HDP and HDP 2.3. So I've rushed through a bunch of things. I think a couple of key concepts. We're in the right place at the right time. Open enterprise Hadoop is a really important concept. We're actually starting to see those values that we knew were there once all the data got together and smart people got to look at the data. And we think it's important to continue to invest in making those analytics both innovative and trusted to find that next tier of enterprise value. At this point though, I'm gonna stop talking and I'm going to turn it over to the presenter you really want to hear from. Uh, one of our customers has actually gone and delivered value from the Hadoop ecosystem and the Hadoop stack. So please help me welcome Russ to the stage. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Uh, I'm going to warn you all, I got great news right before I came on. They killed the presentation clock and said I could go as long as I, could want, as I wanted. So be warned, I may deviate from the slides. Uh, I'm the head of our data platform at TrueCar, which can mean a lot of things to people. Uh, but basically, if there's data that comes into the company and needs to go out, it'll flow through the technology that my team delivers. Uh, I don't know if everybody has uh, used TrueCar. I assume not because I'm not seeing it in the sales numbers. Uh, so I encourage everyone, if you're in the market or you're about to be in the market, please go use TrueCar. What we are is a marketplace uh, that helps people buy and sell cars. Uh, we've been around for about 10 years. We, uh, we went public last year. And the whole premise is very, very simple and right in line with everything that everybody here is doing. It's about giving data to everybody who's operating in the marketplace. Uh, we believe that truth and transparency is just a better way to do business. Uh, and so what I'm going to present to you is our true story uh, about our usage of Hadoop and our growth in that. So here is, I guess, I'm probably revealing the money slide too early in this presentation, but uh, I wanted to get it out so you could, you could understand it. Uh, a couple of years ago, about 15 of us from my team and a couple other teams in TrueCar came out here to Hadoop Summit. Uh, and I distinctly remember the chuckles I got when I put in the budget to have everybody fly up here, spend all this money at hotels and restaurants and, and learn all this Hadoop stuff. And they're like, Russ, who are you kidding? We're only using about 20 terabytes of data. We can shove that in traditional warehouses, which we were doing. You know, we had some five data warehouses with 206 different databases in them. And everybody was like, but, but really, we can just clean some of that out and, and move on, right? Like this Hadoop thing, is this really going to stick around? And I was adamant with a couple of my other tech leaders. I said, no, you, 
you don't see where this is going. As TrueCar grows and it becomes more mobile and more real time at the dealership, uh, the data is going to demand that we think completely differently around how we collect, analyze, and distribute the data. Uh, lo and behold, we jumped headfirst into it with Hortonworks in July of 2013. Uh, I and my team, you know, the executives have empowered me and said, Russ, you spend what you need to spend to give us capabilities faster. So I did that and immediately had my pal John uh, provision as much hardware as we could possibly order. Uh, and so we threw a couple petabytes uh, of, of nodes up, uh, which we were able to get the economics. And I just want to lay to rest, anybody who's still thinking economics are an issue, uh, we're able to achieve 23 cents per gig on our storage, which just means we don't have to think about it anymore. Uh, so we got going and it was like, okay, great. We have all this hardware, we have all this, this latent capability, but we have no applications. We don't have any applications because we don't have any developers that are great at Hadoop which probably many of you in this room are, it may be in the back of your heads that that's the real challenge. This is a brand new technology, there's all sorts of capabilities and it's really hard sometimes. And I said, you know what, it's not a problem, it's not a problem. And of course the chuckles were still there. I said, we're just gonna train everybody. We're gonna hire and we're gonna train. And so we started doing that. And we started with one Hadoop developer that was actually pretty good. And then it was two, and then it was three. And today we have over 25, uh, what I would consider experts in, in our Hadoop infrastructure. Uh, and we're extremely effective at recruiting new ones now to the point where I don't have to put up the, we're hiring slide anymore. We're actually getting inbound requests for people that wanna play with our data and play with our Hadoop infrastructure. Well, to add to all of this, uh, we, we desired to go public uh, last year and we had a very uh, accelerated pace for going public. Uh, which puts a lot of pressure on when, when you're the guy who says, you know, in the middle of all this, I'm going to go ahead and transform our entire data infrastructure while we're attempting to do all the things you need to do to go public, while you're growing at a 30% year-over-year clip on revenue and, and other metrics, uh, we're just going to go ahead and continue to do this crazy transformation. Lo and behold, it works. We go public. Um, and we start launching real applications on Hadoop. And what I mean by real applications... And the Hortonworks guys sometimes hate when I say this, uh, especially the sales guy. Uh, and I think many of them will remember when they were talking with me early on in our partnership, I said, I don't do POCs because POCs are crap in the end. They, they end up giving you sort of a half application that may tell you something, but usually doesn't. And I, I, don't, and I mean that in terms of actual big data because the real applications escape the scale of your existing systems very quickly. So there's really no way for you to say, is this related to this? Are these metrics compared? They're not. And I wanted to do something that was just gonna very clearly establish value. And so we started rebuilding what is one of our most important systems, which is our vehicle intelligence system. And what that is, that's a system that takes in all of the vehicle records that are laying out there in the world, everything that you would want to know about a car, we have to bring in constantly throughout the day as the data on those cars are changing, new and used cars, uh, the prices on those cars, everything. And we have to constantly be synthesizing it and spitting it out into the various applications. Uh, it's, a, it's an incredibly business rule intensive system, which is also not something you typically launch with in Hadoop, at least in what I've seen. You typically do the more aggregate analytic thing, not some big rule driven, got to be perfect, get all the data right. Um, but we did it. And we launched uh, what we call the 2.0 version in August uh, of last year. And it was, it was one of those transformational things because we went from being able to spit out uh, all this vehicle intelligence once a day on the on the core vehicles we cared about, uh, to being able to do that main every still use minutes but, you know, across the entire right set of vehicles so that we're bringing in. I, I also and think our awareness that. of vehicles was possible, also so, so what have to get uh, there. I could go into globally. many, many other just applications that we've so deployed so over, you know, example. we're just Cisco constantly lock. churning it out every three months, Josh, and, you're uh, and it's starting to get to the really fun key stuff component uh, with driving the machine learning, some of the stuff we'll talk about in a few minutes, but, you know, just take a look at some of the metrics that are put up there, and they, they don't represent the whole story, but I'm hoping they give you a sense of, of, of the growth and the, and the real work that we're doing there. Uh, and on the last part, you can see just, just how much data that we're bringing in. By no means, do we have the most data of anybody on the planet? But I wanted to give everybody here who's just getting started or is in like their second application, just a sense you know, of how quickly this stuff actually does grow. 
So what's the point? You know, what is underlying? What's driving what we're doing? Um, and so I've, I've showed this slide. Usually I put a giant brain on it, but for the sake of the slide being readable, I didn't put the brain on it. But the idea is to be the brain of the industry. And what that means, if I decompose that, uh, we need to accurately identify assets in the marketplace. That can be a vehicle, that can be a consumer, that can be a loan, that could be a lease, that could be an insurance policy. And why I say identification is super important. You can't be wrong in automotive. The transaction is way too complicated. So if you're wrong, you lose the transaction. If you're wrong, you get in trouble. You can't be wrong. So we have to accurately identify what we're dealing with all of the time. Then the premise of true car that I just talked to you about was make sure you can assess the value. And what I mean, I didn't use price or anything like that because value is what's important. We need to establish prices and then show context for why those prices are what they are. If you've seen the true car curve, use the mobile app and you've seen the analytics on this stuff. We, the, the, the goal for our consumer and our dealers and the auto manufacturers is to make sure people understand why the market is currently pricing where the market is. And again, that relies on knowing what you're dealing with and then constantly finding out new data points that might tell us more about the value. Third, and you know, this is a theme that you've heard out of lots of folks here, which is we need to be able to predict and prescribe who, what, when, how much, et cetera. Um, and so if you look at the, the stuff in the middle, I, I, I try and say things in a simple and straightforward way, especially so that I can like constantly keep the developers on track. Our goal is to acquire everything literally every piece of data we can in the automotive industry, synthesize it within 15 minutes. Now that may not sound like real time, but if any of you are familiar with automotive data, you've gone to a dealership, you, you've went through a transaction, you can understand and appreciate what it would mean to actually be able to synthesize any given data source within 15 minutes. There are data sources, yes, I can consume in real time, such as user behavior on the web, people clicking on things, et cetera. But there are other data sources in an industry like automotive that move at different time scales and have different fidelity during those time scales. So I'm proposing something that I believe is pretty radical for this industry in technology. Uh, and then on the bottom end, it very much uh, is, is a mirror to the, to the top part of that, which is we need to make everything easily accessible. And what that means isn't we aggregate everything into a nice EDW, we put some reports on it, everybody gets an email about it, it's the same thing every day, blah, 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 blah. No, we are much more moving to what I would consider a contextually aware intelligent search engine. I think there's lots of uh, big giant tech companies that are also realizing the fact that consumer demand is dictating and user interfaces on phones uh, and different devices dictating that there will not be a set UI. There will not be a time for you to perfectly create a linear experience and a linear data set that will deliver perfectly for every person. Instead, you kind of have to open it up and let people search through your data and forage for what they need. And in, in a lot of cases, in, in the case of automotive transactions, you also need to be able to learn from that foraging and push people the contextually relevant information, you know, at the time that you think they need it. So the technologies that, that we've been deploying, uh, obviously HDP, uh, we've gone through a couple, uh, you can tell from the last couple of years, a couple up upgrade cycles. So super excited that they're working on more and more automated rolling upgrade stuff. Uh, we've deployed Spark into some of our most mission critical uh, algorithms on the back end uh, to do our transaction matching and things like that. Uh, we've deployed Elasticsearch to great effect, uh, which has had a similar uh, transformational uh, effect on what we do and how we deliver the information. And then more recently, uh, we're developing advanced multidimensional real-time visualizations using the Unity engine uh, and some processing. Uh, and if you want to go where hopefully your heads are going, very much so uh, exploring minority report like experiences with it within the true car data sets uh, and it's not fiction like I if you want to see some of this I'm happy to show you you know if you catch me on the floor out there so to give you some some numbers on this uh, this is what we do at true car and you and you saw it in the, the first slide our data has grown 24x in the last 12 months that comes from you know over 12,000 third-party data feeds that come in every day uh, obviously, we have, a, we have 
a bunch of events, event data that we also generate uh, to the tune of 65 billion uh, data points that we're processing through this data platform. Uh, we have to put valuations and price reports on 200 billion possible new car combinations and all the options and things that you can put on a car. Uh, we've processed over 710 million vehicle images, which I hope is surprising to some people that you, you wouldn't think that that is something a company like TrueCar has to do. But actually, you know, we've had dealers tell us, and I, I kind of laughed at it first when I heard it, and then I thought, eh, that's kind of true. If, a, if an image, if there's no vehicle image, the car doesn't exist. Uh, and so images are actually an important data set that TrueCar deals with, both just in being able to, to show people what vehicles are out there, but there's a ton of intelligence embedded in those, in those images. Uh, and then we've, you know, over a 10 year period, uh, we've seen over 20 million car buyers go through our platform. Uh, so that's, that's no small data set. Uh, and then, you know, and Scott had mentioned it, the open enterprise, you know, is that just a buzzword? Uh, it's not, and we've kind of lived it even before uh, Horton Works started to use the, the phrasing. Uh, because our, our vision with that data platform was to make sure that we got out of our own way. Put all the data somewhere, make sure everybody who's supposed to get at it can get at it easily. Our, our own, the, the stuff that I was saying about giving search away to the consumers is also what we give to our internal people. We eat our own dog food. Internally, you need to be able to search those same data sets and learn from those and decide how you want to uh, compose those and get those out to the world. So, you know, again, in terms of number, we had a 72x improvement on our inventory processing, even while adding more business rules, more data, et cetera. And that's only accelerating as we get better and better with the technology and as the platform, the Hadoop platform itself continues to improve. Uh, we had a 24x improvement in image processing, uh, which we will we'll take you through the technology. We'll open up and show you that technology later in a talk that me and, and one of my great engineers, Anil, will be given later today. Uh, and I'm really excited because he'll go pretty deep into what we did there. Uh, you know, we had a 20x improvement in the number of, of internal Hadoop experts. Uh, we had a 12x improvement for things like Clickstream. So obviously that's good stuff. And we, we just, it doesn't matter where we've deployed Hadoop and Hadoop related technologies. We've seen these kind of improvements. And when you combine that with the economics I talk about, I mean, I don't have a budget that I sit there and worry about. No, what I worry about is the speed at which I can continue to drive features that drive those kind of numbers. It's a competitive advantage that TrueCar did what we did, which is we jumped into this technology long before this room was completely filled uh, with people that are just getting started. It's important in the auto industry to lead the way, even if it's super risky. What that's led to, you know, in qualitative terms, uh, developer productivity. Yes, early on it was hard because people had to learn new things and some of the things were still early and immature. Uh, but over time, the key was giving people access to the data because if the developers can understand the data and see where, we're, see where the value is, they'll develop better solutions upstream for processing that data. Uh, data science capabilities, those are obvious. I, I think some people think that the data science, the key to data science is you know, having really cool stats models and really advanced, like, computer software things that make you visualize. No, the key thing is speed. Because if you, whatever models you're doing, and I, I went to or the Red Point talk on machine learning and he kind of hinted at it, which was you need to be able to test your theories as fast as possible. Almost every machine learning technique, its bottleneck becomes the speed at which you can train something. So I focused almost exclusively on speed, getting information processed faster so that everybody can experiment even more and more. And no experiment is gonna tell us the answer. There's gonna be answers that get pulled back and we have to rethink it, just constantly redoing it. That's the key to our improvements in data science. And then of course, the recruiting engagement. And I can't stress that enough. If I, if I had underestimated one thing in my own hubris, thinking I can talk people into things, uh, it was really making sure that we could hire people. It's super competitive out there. Uh, and we took it, Instead, the way we were going to do it is, is be a little risky and say, we will train you. And we know these skills are going to enable you to go on in your career and make lots of money doing whatever you love. But we're willing to take that risk that if we continue to be fast and inventive, you'll want to continue working here. And I, and I think if you talk to any of our engineers in my group, we've had extremely low turnover in the last two years, which to me is a metric that I really, really care about. So where, where is this all going? And again, this isn't fiction. That's why I call this the, the future present. 
because uh, uh, a lot of times we'll say, oh, the future, the future. And I'm always like, when is the future going to get here? Like, uh, the example I always use, it's like, Dipping Dots has been the ice cream of the future for like 30 years, and we're not eating Dipping Dots every day. So I don't want to keep saying the future. I'm saying it's here. It's actually here. So here on the screen, I have some as visuals to represent what I'm going to say, but I want to make sure you understand it. We have already started deploying what I call uh, market simulations. And what these are to us is that we give dealers, OEMs, our, ourselves, ways to turn dials, turn knobs on various facets of the data. Some things we know very well, some things that are on the edge. When you turn those dials, our data platform goes to work and it says, hey, if somebody decides to, to drop an incentive in this region, in this marketplace, on this vehicle, what's going to happen to the rest of the market? Then another guy does the same thing over here and over here, and you start letting these, these uh, simulations interact with each other. And all they are is millions and millions of experiments. But it's important that we run those experiments and have the user base run those experiments and have the dealers run those experiments because we learn through those experiments about things that are likely to happen should all these dials actually in the real world be turned. Well, what that does is that helps people prescribe their own strategies and deploy those strategies. Well, I'm talking from the uh, auto manufacturers as well as the dealers. So what, what that helps TrueCar understand is where is this dynamic marketplace moving? And, and it's interesting because is there any way to do a long range prediction on something like the auto marketplace? Absolutely not. But is there a way to get a two day advantage you know, against your competitor on where that market be go might be going? Absolutely. And now those two days can, can mean a big difference uh, when you're talking to the scale of the automotive industry. So beyond those simulations, which obviously some of those simulations are deployed purely as analytic things, but ultimately those simulations get deployed through our mobile experience where users are out in the real world. And over half of our users now are, are using mobile. They're going to the dealership. We understand where they are. We've geofenced them. Uh, we can deliver information based on where this marketplace is going at the right time. We've already deployed this, this product in a little way, and I encourage you to go use it and experience it. Uh, and, and we're right now in kind of the version 1.0 of it, but it's going to get pretty advanced. Um, and then on, on the, the furthest side there with all the, the, the pretty maps, uh, we're going to give all the data away. Uh, we believe so much in the truth and transparency and what it can do to a marketplace to make it efficient that we're going to expose all of this through beautiful interfaces, through search interfaces to all of our partners. Uh, all of the auto manufacturers, all of the dealers, all of you, and you will be able to plug into our data platform and explore it to your heart's content. Because at the end of the day, we just believe the more everybody's informed about the automotive industry at every aspect of it, the more that they will actually transact and the better experience that they will actually have. Uh, and again, this is, this is not the future. I encourage everybody, go experience this uh, on our service. Yes, because I would like all of you to use the service, but also I want you to understand that this is not in the back office. This is stuff, our platform is powering uh, what you see out there and it's doing a lot of business. Uh, the one last thing I wanted to mention, because Scott kind of got into it, um, and I think if I had a little bit of a technical challenge that people gave me was, you know, is Hadoop gonna work in the enterprise? As if that's somehow, like I wasn't doing enterprisey things with TrueCar. Um, which is really interesting. And, you know, so we talk about data governance and master data management and security. Of course, of course. It could do it two, three, four years ago. It just was harder than it is going to be in something like HCP 2.3, which is great. But for me, that was never a roadblock.